And everyone, I'm glad to see you out with us this evening for our Bible class. Whether you are a visitor or a member here, we're thankful that you've chosen to be with us. We are especially uh, thankful for those who are visiting with us tonight and uh, want you to know that you're our honored guests. Uh, we're going to sing number 680, There's Not a Friend. And then uh, Justin's going to teach us out here in the auditorium class tonight. We'll sing the first and third verses of this song. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus, no. Good evening. I'm totally kidding. I'm not teaching from up here. <laughs> I was waiting for somebody to be like, what are you doing? But you were all just going to let me go with it. So, all right. You do what? <laughs> I like to keep my distance. You know, I got used to that six feet apart. And uh, yeah, so, all right. If you want to be open in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 25, Genesis chapter 25 is uh, where we'll be studying from just a, in just a few moments. There was a, a gentleman who had gone bear hunting, and he was off doing his thing. He was a big time hunter, and he was so excited about this bear hunt, and he was, he was out there, and he saw a bear walking by, and he pulled his rifle up, and he began to fire, begun to fire. Man, he missed. He tried to get ready, tried again, you know, let me see if I can hit this bear. And once again, he, he missed the bear. And after two or three shots, he, you know, was getting frustrated with his rifle. And all of a sudden, he, he stumbled, and he fell down the mountainside. And he fell into a, a bear trap. And he couldn't get out. And all of a sudden, he noticed that bear that he was shooting at was now coming toward him. And he didn't look very happy. He was an angry bear. And immediately the guy began to realize, I'm in trouble. Uh, you know, I was shooting at this bear. Now this bear is going to get back at me. And so he did the only thing he knew to do. He started to pray. And he said, dear God, I know that I have not been the kind of person I need to be. I've made a lot of mistakes. And I've failed you in a lot of ways. And I, I repent of those sins. And I just ask right now, Father, that if you will turn this bear into a Christian, I will be the best behaved Christian. I will follow your word. I will do everything you ask of me. And about that time, he finished his prayer. He looked up, and all of a sudden, that bear just stopped dead in its tracks. And that bear dropped to his knees, and he clasped his paws together, and he said, Dear God, thank you for this food I'm about to receive. <laughs> Promises. <laughs> we make a lot of promises. Come on in, we won't bite. It's a Philip, he's always late. So I hope that's not on YouTube. <laughs> Sorry, brother. <laughs> he, he's, used, he's, he's used to it. He's used to it. 
Um, what was I saying? Promises. We all make promises. Uh, but we, we struggle to keep our promises, right? I mean, for, for a lot of us, you know, we're, we're quick to make promises, but sometimes we're, you know, just as quick to, to break those promises. But when it comes to someone else, right, well, we, we expect them to kind of fulfill their, their end of the bargain, right? Kind of reminds me of the story uh, uh, I heard about the little girl. This little girl asked her father, said, Daddy, do, do all fairy tales begin with once upon a time? And dad said, well, no, honey. He said, not all fairy tales begin that way. Some fairy tales begin with, when I'm elected, I promise to. <laughs> I'm sorry if you're a politician. So I'm sure some do keep their word. Uh, but, you know, we struggle to keep promises. But when we look at other people, if other people make promises to us, we expect them to fulfill their end of the bargain, right? I expect you to keep your promises. If you make a promise to your child or your children, let me tell you, they're not going to let you forget about that promise, right? They're going to expect you to fulfill that promise. And it doesn't matter. You can make a promise when they're five or six years old and say, hey, when you're 16 or 17, if such and such happens, I promise to do this. You'll forget about that promise probably within a couple of weeks. Maybe a couple of days for some of us, right? But that child on their 16th or 17th birthday, guess what they're going to remember? They're going to remember that promise you made. The story of Scripture and the story of ultimately Jesus coming to earth and, 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 and the seed of Jesus Christ began with a promise. A promise that was made back all the way in, in Genesis chapter 12. You, you remember the promise, right? God calls Abram to, to leave his homeland, to leave his, his country and his family. And he tells him, you go to this, this land that I'm going to show you and I will make of you a, a great nation. And he talks about, I will bless you and make your name great so you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and him who curses you uh, or dishonors you, I, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And you remember as, as he makes that promise, he packs up, he sets out, and he, he begins to, to follow God's call. And he, he begins to do what God asked him to, but, but somewhere along the way he kind of got tired of waiting. And he began to, to, to realize, you know, God made this promise to me and, and, and this idea that I'm going to be uh, a blessing to, for my family. All the nations of the earth are going to be blessed, but I don't have a child. I don't have an heir of my own name, right? And so God makes that promise to Abraham when Abraham was 75 years old. How old was Abraham when Isaac was born? Hmm? A hundred. Yeah. Everybody's looking at me like, is this a trick question? No trick question. No. He was a hundred. So if, if my math's correct, he waited 25 years for that promise to be fulfilled. But here's what's interesting about that. Isaac married when he was 40 years old. But he had no children until he was 60. So from the time God made the promise to Abraham until really you could really see that promise start to be fruitful and multiply, 85 years passed in time. That's a long time to wait for a promise to be fulfilled. But that's the story of Abraham, and that's the story of the promise that we read about in Scripture. And as Abraham begots Isaac, Isaac eventually will have twin sons, who we know as Esau and Jacob, right? And it's through Jacob, through his seed, that the nation of Israel is going to come. A lot of time has to pass, right, before you begin to see that promise. Abraham is passed on at this point. Right? He, he got to see Isaac, but he, he, everything was, is a promise God made, but it was later in history before you begin to see that promise be really fulfilled. What we're going to do in this quarter is we're going to study about uh, the forefather, so to speak, uh, of the, the lineage of the history of Israel. We're going to study about the life of Jacob. Uh, and the life of Jacob is an interesting one. I don't know if you've ever done a, a lot of heavy study on the, on the life of Jacob, but Jacob is an individual that I think probably a lot of us can relate to. You know, if you, if you think about New Testament characters, excuse me, New Testament people, they're not characters, they're real people. New Testament people that you can relate to, one of the people that I say I relate to more than any other is Peter. 
Right? Because Peter was quick to speak and not so quick to think. And sometimes I make that same mistake. Right? So I really relate to Peter. Well, if I was going to to look at people the Old Testament and say, I can really relate to this guy. I think the answer might be Jacob. Because Jacob was a man of faith, a man of deep faith, a man who is praised in the, the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. But he was a man who struggled with his faith. He was a man who was often met with challenges, and sometimes he, he didn't handle those challenges very well. And so I, I really relate to the story of Jacob. So as we embark on this study tonight, I want us to begin in Genesis chapter 25. Genesis chapter 25, and I want us to, to notice first the family uh, of Jacob. The Bible records these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethel, uh, of the Aramean, of Pedan. Uh, Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. So as the story unfolds here, we're, we're, we're learning about Abraham's son, Isaac, the, the son of promise. It's through him that the seed is going to come, that the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And what jumps off the page in the very beginning is the faith of this family. Specifically the, the faith of, of Isaac and really the faith of of Rebecca, Because the Bible tells us that there's a problem here as the story opens. What's the problem? Rebecca's what? She's barren. And at this point in time, she's been barren for 20 years. Okay? 20 years that she's dealing with. Who else do you know in Scripture that was barren? Yeah, Sarah. Hannah, we think about Hannah, but, but Sarah, right? Uh, we think about her mother-in-law, right? Genesis chapter 11, verse 30 tells us that, that she was barren until the Lord opened her womb uh, and blessed her with, with Isaac. And so it's interesting, she, or Isaac, just like his father, is married to a woman who's described as being barren, unable to have kids, within, which in that culture, if you weren't able to have kids, you were looked on as being cursed. You've done something really bad. You've sinned in some mighty way, and, and God is showing displeasure with you because He's not opening your womb. But here's what's interesting about that. When, when God, even, think about this, Sarah was basically barren for, you know, I mean, she was 90, so not quite 90 years, because, you know, I guess you're not barren when you're a child. I don't, I don't know how that works. But, but you, you get the gist. She was barren for a long time, right, before she had, had a child. And when Abraham was made that promise he, uh, that he was going to have this seed, he was 75 years old. And Isaac's not born until he's 100, but there's an incident that happens in Genesis chapter 16 where Abraham's response to God's uh, waiting is, hey, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. Right? And you remember what he does in Genesis chapter 16, right? He takes, uh, Sarah gives him her handmaiden Hagar, and he takes her, he sleeps with her, she conceives and bears a son, and they name him Ishmael. Right? And in Genesis chapter 16 and verse 16, the Bible says that Abraham was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. Okay, do the math. The promise was made when he was 75. Right? You're going to have the son through, through your seed. All the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. At 86, 86 Ishmael is born. So how long did, did Abraham wait for God to fulfill that promise before he decided to take matters in his own hands? About 11 years. Right? And he finally said, you know what? I, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. We'll do things, we'll do things my way. Right? Here's what's interesting about Isaac. Notice the difference between Abraham, father, and son Isaac. How long has Isaac's wife been barren? 20 years. And in 20 years, he's not taking his wife's handmaiding, he's not taking a concubine or a servant girl or anything like that. You know what he's doing? He's praying. And it's interesting, as you think about that in the Hebrew, that, that word there that's, that's translated praying, the idea isn't that he prayed one time. And it's not that, hey, he waited until 20 years of barrenness and finally said, okay, we got to do something. I'm going to start praying. The idea is that he began to pray from the beginning. And throughout her barrenness, he prayed and he prayed and he pleaded with God. He interceded on behalf of his wife. God, open her womb. Bless her. 
And you get to the end of, of that verse, and the Bible tells us the Lord granted his prayer. And he opened the womb of Rebecca, and she bore these, these sons. There's two interesting things here that I want you to think about that I think this passage kind of teaches us. Number one, it teaches us that conception is supernatural, right? Conception comes from God. God is the one who opens the womb. God is the one who blesses us with children. Uh, and we should never take that for granted. Um, it's, it's God-given. And, and so we have the children in our lives because God has blessed us with those children. That's the first thing. But the second thing that's interesting to me is that he prayed basically for 20 years for something to happen. And that talks, that, that, that's really testing patience, right? That really challenges you to think about the idea of persistence in prayer, right? Being persistent in praying. In fact, one scholar, when he talked about Jacob and this praying, said he prayed until he prevailed. I love that thought. Because sometimes I'm guilty of, of praying and Maybe I'll pray for something a few times, and eventually either maybe I think maybe God's heard enough of it, right? He knows by now I don't need to say any more, or I guess he's just not going to respond the way I want him to. And so I, you just give up. Can you imagine praying for something for 20 years? Isaac prayed until he prevailed. But here's what's interesting. You, you keep reading in the story, and you get to verse 22. And the Bible tells us that the children struggled together within her. And so she said, if this is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. It's interesting, as, as she becomes pregnant, and she's got these uh, babies in her womb. At this point, all she knows is she's pregnant. And if you've ever been pregnant, women, then, you know, from what I'm told, you know, you can feel the rustle and the tussle of the baby, right? And you can feel uh, when maybe baby's not so happy with you, right? The kicks. I remember Miranda used to, you know, say, hey, hey, Phil, I feel him kicking, you know? And I'm like, I can't really feel anything, you know? But she's like, no, it's really, he's really kicking, you know? But uh, mama knows. And Mama Rebecca knew something's not right. Like, in fact, the Hebrew word for this, this word uh, struggled means to crush or to oppress. <laughs> so literally, there's a battle going on in her womb between these children. And she realizes something's not right. And so she asked this question, hey, I'm supposed to have these children, right? God made this promise to my father-in-law that through uh, the seed of his son, my husband Isaac, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. But what's going on? What's the deal with this? And it says that she goes and she inquires of the Lord. And what's interesting is it doesn't tell us how she inquired of the Lord. It doesn't tell us what that means. It doesn't tell us, um, you know, how she did that. Did she do that through some type of prophet? Did she do that through her husband? Did she do that herself? It just tells us that she inquired of the Lord. But here's what's interesting. Verse 23, the Lord said to her, so basically, Isaac prays, God responds. Rebecca prays, inquires of the Lord through some means, and the Lord answers her. And notice what he says. He says, two nations are in your womb, and the two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Rebecca, not only are you having one child right now, you're going to have twins. And these twins, well, guess what? They're, they're, they're struggling right now because they're two different nations of people, right? The, the stage is being set for basically uh, the rest of the history uh, between Israel and Edom, which is where the Edomites come from, from Esau, right? Because they're going to be basically at odds with each other throughout the history of Israel. They're going to be struggling with one another. And he says, they're struggling right now because there's these two nations of people, but here's what's going to happen. The older will serve the younger. Now, what's, what stands out about that? Why would that be interesting? If you're Rebecca and you, you're wanting to know what's going on, and he's talking about this tussle that's taking place in your womb, and here's why this is taking place, because the, the older is actually going to serve the younger. How, why would that get your attention? The older always has preference. The birthright. 
It's a little different in our culture today, right? I mean, I guess in one sense, you know, there's things about your firstborn that, you know, they make you a mama and a daddy, and, and maybe there's some partiality there in that sense. Not favoritism, but just the fact that, hey, they were the ones that, that made us parents, so to speak. But in that culture, the older was the one who would assume the family responsibility. So if you were the older sibling, you would be the head of the household. You would end up being the, the leader when dad passed away. But God says, hey, these two twins that you're having, the younger is actually going to be the head. The older will actually serve under the younger one. And then you go on. And it says, and when her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red, all of his body like a hairy cloak. Can you imagine being described that way? I've often thought, like... How would somebody describe you? I hope they wouldn't say, well, he was red and really hairy, you know? But here Esau is. He's red and really hairy, so they call him Esau because the words red and hairy in in Hebrew, when you put them together, they sound like the word Esau. So they called him Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out, and he was holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Jacob means heel holder, or he who grabs the heel, or he who cheats. And... The passage tells us in the end of verse 26, Isaac was 60 years old when she bore him. So two two children come out, right? And and one named Esau, one is named Jacob, and Rebekah knows, hey, guess what? Esau is going to serve Jacob. That is the promise that God has made. The older is going to, to serve the younger. So you get to verse 27. And all of a sudden, we fast forward in their life, right? We have no, no words, no history recorded for us about their, their childhood outside of the fact that they were born and what their names were. Because now we're going to pick up from the story, and they're older. And we're going to see the, the favoritism of this family and the problems it's going to lead to. It says, when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful, skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, game, but Rebekah loved Isaac. So as you think about this, you begin to notice these two individuals are opposite of one another, right? Uh, they're, they're, They're not very similar at all. If you've got siblings, you know, maybe you and your siblings, maybe you have a lot of things in common. You know, if you're like me and my brother, you know, we have the same parents and, and maybe in one sense kind of look the same. But outside of that, there's a lot of differences between my brother and me. I mean, we're completely different people. His interests are not my interests. My interests are not his interests, right? That's Jacob and Esau, right? Jacob is this out, outdoor man, right? He's this, he's this hunter. He's this guy that enjoys being outside. He enjoys game, sport, things of that nature. Jacob, on the other hand, he's a... He's a quiet man. He's a, he's a man who enjoys dwelling in the tents. We might call him a homebody, right? He, he just likes to be home. And so you've got two different brothers, two different ways, and you've got two parents. And notice, each parent has their favorite child. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. He, he loved what Esau could do for him. Perhaps he loved Esau because Isaac was kind of a passive individual, and Esau was the exact opposite of that. So maybe that, that's partly to do with it. But Rebecca, on the other hand, she loved Jacob. She loved the boy who was quiet, who dwelt in tents, the homebody. We might say she loved him because he was a, he was a mama's boy. Right? That's basically what it comes down to. So dad loves one child, and mama loves the other child more, and that's the, the home they grow up in. And that's going to be the root of the problem that you're going to see between these two in their history. And, and the problem that you see here, the favoritism that you read about here, it's explored further in Genesis chapter 27 with the blessing. And it's rooted even more in the life of Jacob when you get to Genesis chapter 37 and you begin to read about Jacob and his own sons and the favoritism that he shows one of his sons, right? As parents, we have to be careful to not play favorites, to not show favoritism. In fact, one of the prayers that that we ought to pray when we have multiple children is, God, don't allow me to be a person who shows favoritism. Don't Don't allow me to be a person who chooses one child over the other. Because if we create that culture where we begin to show favoritism, 
we're opening ourselves up for some, some big problems. And that's what's going to happen with Jacob and Esau. So you've got the family, you've got uh, the, the favoritism, and now I want you to see the failure here. And the, really the failure, it's a failure of both brothers. Because I want you to notice, as it opens up in verse 29, it says, Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and, and he was exhausted. And I think it's an interesting that it's worded this way. He's exhausted. And so Esau says to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stew, for I'm exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom. It's interesting because the way the Hebrew reads is that when Esau comes in from the field, he's tired. He sees his brother there cooking something, and this is what he says. In the Hebrew he says, give me some of that red, red stuff. That's all he knows. I'm exhausted. I'm hungry. He's going to say in a moment, I'm at the point of death because, you know, sometimes we say that I'm starving to death, even though we're not, right? But he's feeling this way, and he says, I want you to give me some of that red stuff. Doesn't matter what it is, I, I just need it right now. And he's called Edom because in the Hebrew that, that word for red sounds a lot like the word Edom. So, hey bro, I'm the older one, give me some of your, give, give me some of your stuff you're cooking. I'm hungry. And Jacob, the opportunist that he is, says, well, you sell me your birthright. You want some of this? Okay, but you've got you to sell me your birthright. Now here's, here's what is the birthright? What is the birthright? Okay. Under the Mosaic Law, there was, there was basically three aspects of it. Now, this is before the Mosaic Law, so, you know, maybe it's, it's different. Uh, maybe it's exactly the same as it would be under the Mosaic Law. Um, but nonetheless, Jacob knows what the birthright is, and Esau certainly knows what the, uh, the birthright is, and Moses knows what the birthright is. And it's apparently a big deal. But under the Mosaic Law, Deuteronomy chapter 21, typically with the birthright you had three things. Number one, you had authority. Because you became the, the head of the family if, if dad passed away. So you were the authority. Number two is a place of position. Because as the head of the family, you also became the spiritual leader. You become the priest for the family. And then number three, it was about property, about inheritance. You, you would get a double portion of the inheritance. So in my case, I have three siblings. And so my brother, if we lived in this day and time, my brother would get 50% of whatever my parents had as an inheritance, and my sister and I would split the other 50 Man, it stinks to not be the oldest in that case. Thankfully, we don't play by those rules anymore. Um, but that's how it would be. And so Jacob, whatever this is, he understands the significance of it, and he says, I want you to give it to me. And notice what Esau says. Esau says, I'm about to die. I, what use is this birthright to me? If I die, it doesn't really matter. So Jacob said, swear to me now. I want to make sure this is a done deal that the birthright is mine. So he told him, uh, swore to him, and Jacob uh, sold his birthright to Jacob. And then here's what's interesting. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. <laughs> what a terrible, terrible trade. I mean, there's no meat. I mean, that's just a bad deal. But he was so hungry and he was so exhausted and he made this decision when he was physically, emotionally, spiritually spent to trade something of great value for something that was very temporary. He traded something of great value for something immediate, immediate gratification. In fact, the Bible goes on to say that Esau despised his birthright. And you get to Hebrews chapter 12 and you read this about Esau. The Bible tells us that Esau was an unholy man. Some translations say he was a profane man. Uh, one translation I think calls him a, a godless man. He was a man who didn't think, he, he wasn't concerned about the family, he wasn't concerned about spiritual things. He just wanted to be outdoors. He wanted to do outdoorsy things. And you keep reading and it describes more this unholy man who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterwards when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no chance to repent. And this is the English Standard Translation. He found no chance to repent though he sought it with tears. And the idea is not that he couldn't repent. The idea was he couldn't change things. Right? The deed was done. He sold his birthright for a meal, a single meal, and immediately he realized, I've messed up. And he couldn't change it. 
bad decision. And that sets the stage for the life of Jacob. And Esau is going to intermingle a couple more times, but most of the rest of this is just going to focus simply on Jacob. But what I want to do the last five minutes we have is think about a few life lessons uh, from, from this text uh, that we can, we can talk about. And this class goes by fast. <laughs> life lesson number one, God is not bound by our timetable. You know, it's interesting, all throughout the book of Genesis, this idea is played out. Abraham waits 25 years for Isaac to be born. Isaac waits 20 years for Jacob and Esau to be born. Jacob works 14 years for, for, for his wives. Joseph waits over 20 years to be reconciled to his brothers. Right? All throughout the book of Genesis, it's a waiting period. And you begin to understand God isn't bound by our timetable. Psalm 31 verse 15 talks about how our time is in His hands. Right? God, our time is in God's hand. And listen, with God's timing, there is no wrong time. So often I get impatient because I don't get what I think I need and want right now. And you pray, and, and maybe you pray a long time. God, do this. God, do that. Listen, God's not bound by our timetable. He doesn't play by the same rules that we play with. For us, what we have to do is learn to trust God. We have to learn to be people who trust that God is faithful and that He will bless us as He sees fit, that He will fulfill those promises that it's He's made to see fit. You know, it's kind of like the scoffers in the book of Second Peter. You know, where's His coming? He said He was coming. Where's His coming? Right? Why, why do you believe all this? Just give up. God's not bound by our timetable. He doesn't want anyone to perish. So He waits. Eventually that time will run out. But until then, we're not bound by His time, right? Lesson number two, God can do as He wills. Or we could say it this way, God can do as He pleases. Jeremiah 32 verse 27 talks about God um, is the God of all flesh. He says, is anything too hard for me? And the answer is rhetorical. No, nothing's too hard. Not for you, God. You can do anything you want to do. In this case, the, younger, the older will serve the younger. God makes the rules. There are so many times things don't work out the way I want them to. They don't play out maybe according to the way I pray or, or things of that nature. And sometimes it's easy to get upset. And to even maybe ask the question, why? Why, God? Why did you do it? It doesn't make sense to me. But it doesn't have to make sense to me. Because God can do as He wills. God can do as He sees fit. And sometimes maybe the way God see, what God sees fit and what God's will is is maybe different than how I see things or the way I want things to be done. Number three, God doesn't need our help in fulfilling His promises. In the book of Ezekiel there, Ezekiel 12, 25 talks about God saying, hey, listen, if I make this promise, I'm going to fulfill it. I'm a man of my word. Right? You think about Joseph. I think about Jacob, not Joseph. I think about Jacob here. And I think, did Jacob know about the promise that God made when, when God said the, the older would serve the younger? Well, listen, if he was mama's favorite, chances are she probably said something along the way, probably a few times. Jacob didn't need to help God along for him to, to receive the blessing. But Jacob took matters in his own hands. He couldn't wait. He tried to help God along. And sometimes that's what we try to do. We, we try to run ahead of God. We don't need to do that. And this is the last one. I wish we had more time to expand on this one. Don't trade the eternal for the immediate. You know, Jacob made, or Esau made a terrible, terrible decision. A terrible choice. To trade something that was of great value for something that was very cheap. For something that was very temporal. And when I look at our world today, I see people making the same exact decision. They trade the eternal for the immediate, for the temporary. I've seen people who will trade a moment's pleasure to, to, to have an affair, and they'll, they'll give up their family and their, their kids. I've seen individuals who, who will, because they, they want to work and make money and, and have this career, who will work themselves to the point that all they do is work. 
And they sacrifice their family. And they sacrifice time with their children. I see people every day who want to fit in with the world. And want to be accepted and want to be liked. So they trade in they trade in eternity. Matthew 16, Jesus says, What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but he loses his own soul? There's a lot of people someday that will stand before God in judgment. And you know what they're going to realize? They're going to realize I made a bad trade. I traded the eternal for some cheap immediate pleasure. And in the end, with tears in their eyes, they can't change that. There's no turning back. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for all that you do for us. Father, we're so thankful for your word and for the story of Jacob, Father. We pray as we embark on this study this, this quarter, Father, that you'll bless us, that you'll open our hearts and minds to the scriptures and help us, Father, as we examine to see what Scripture says, but also what it can mean for us in the days ahead. Father, we thank you for all that you do. But Father, as we examine tonight and we think about the story of Jacob, Father, we pray that, that we will guard against favoritism in our own families, amongst our own children. And that Father, we will understand that we're not bound by, you're not bound by our timetable. That you have the ability to do as you please, Father, because you are God. And God, I pray that we will never be people who trade the eternal for the immediate. Help us to be people, Father, who realize the value of eternal life and to live lives that are pleasing to you so that someday heaven can be our eternal home. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.